Hello again 102. In this video we will go over the fourth question on chapter 22, The Clash of Cultures. Some examples of reactionary conservatism in the decade of the 1920s. And we talked about some of the intellectual developments already. Now we will talk about some of the trends for the rest of people, millions of people, and the things that were affecting their lives in the culture of the 20s. The lost generation made little sense to the vast majority of Americans, many of whom aggressively defended the established values, the old certainties, and the comfort of past routines. The reactionary conservatism of the 20s fed on the energies provided by militant, traditional Protestantism and a revival of nativism, which has been around before in American history in the 19th century, in mid-century towards Irish people and some of the other newcomers of that time. All ethnic groups face prejudice and bigotry and discrimination when they first come into the United States. There hasn't been any group that ever has not. Nativism defined was reactionary conservative movement characterized by heightened nationalism, anti-immigrant sentiment, and laws, as we'll see in a moment, that they'll get pushed through Congress setting stricter regulations on immigration. The foreign connections of so many political radicals triggered efforts by nativists to close the door to immigrants. We've talked about some of these problems already. The Red Scare, the anarchists that have come in and are trying to stir people up. And many nativists tried, also tried to stir up hatred of immigrants already in the United States and of their un-American religions and ideas, so-called. And Sacco and Vanzetti will be the most celebrated criminal case of the 1920s. It reinforced the connection between European immigrants and political radicalism. They were two Italians coming in at the height of southeastern European immigration to the United States, the immediate post-World War era. And on May the 5th, 1920, two Italians were accused of holding up a shoe factory payroll. And Sacco and Vansetti are going to be charged with stealing $16,000 and killing the paymaster and the guard. Both men had loaded pistols on them when they were arrested. Both lied to the police about their activities, and both were identified by eyewitnesses, but the stolen money was never found. And here is Sacco and Vanzetti defined. Again, this comes at the height of Italian immigration against the backdrop of all the different things that had been going on in the post-World War I era. And despite a lack of clear evidence, the two defendants, both self-professed anarchists, were convicted of murder and they're going to be later executed. And in later 20s, they end up getting executed. Their appeals lasted a long time, seven years. And by the time of their execution, Sacco and Vanzetti had become martyrs, victims of American injustice to millions of people around the world. And the case remains passionately disputed today. And eventually the nativists will push through the Immigration Act of 1924. They will get Congress to pass that. That will restrict the number of immigrants from any one European country to 2% of the total number of immigrants per year, with an overall limit of slightly over 150,000 new arrivals per year. So, from 1924 to the present, there has not been unlimited immigration allowed as it was prior to that year in the United States. It's no longer. And in the 1960s, Further restrictions will be passed, as we'll see, and that's going to open the door to Latin Americans coming in to the United States in droves because the limitations don't really affect them. The most violent of the reactionary movements during the 20s was a revived client. The infamous post-Civil War group of anti-black racists that recreated itself in 1915. 
the old clan had died out in the 1870s with the revival of white rule with the ascension of the southern bourbons to reestablishing democratic party control in the south and then in the last generation of the 19th century they're successful in disenfranchising black males as we saw and then the clan does not have much of a presence and they grow to the point where they actually march in washington on pennsylvania avenue and what will contribute to their resurgence during the 20 and how did the organization's ideology shift with the times this is no longer just a southern group intent on terrorizing african americans the new clan is a nationwide organization devoted to 100 percent americanism only natives white protestants born in the united states could be members the clan promoted strict personal morality opposed bootleg liquor and preached hatred against not only African Americans, but also Roman Catholics, Jews, immigrants, communists, and atheists. The United States was no melting pot, shouted imperial wizard William J. Simmons, a traveling salesman turned Methodist preacher. Ooh, nice. It is a garbage can, he says, when hordes of aliens walk to the ballot box and their votes outnumber yours, then that alien horde has got you by the throat. Hmm. The new clan included a woman's auxiliary group called the Camellia, and whole families attended clan gatherings, clapsing hands while listening to inflammatory speeches, watching fireworks, and burning crosses. Again, this is no longer a Southern organization. During the 20s, 40% of the clan members were in three midwestern states illinois indiana and ohio and connecticut had more clan members than mississippi recruiters called clegals played upon whatever prejudices were most acute in a particular area and this answers that question then at the bottom of the picture of the clan march down pennsylvania avenue whatever hatred there is or prejudice there is in an area well okay let's feed on that you know, in Texas, they'll feed on the prejudice against Mexicans. In California, it'll focus on Japanese Americans. And in New York, the enemy was primarily Jews and Catholics. The new Klan also benefited from the war on alcohol. Klansmen then declared war on bootleggers and moonshiners. And by 1923, the Klan had more than 4 million members, including judges, mayors, sheriffs, state legislators, six governors, and three United States senators. And the Grand Dragon of Indiana, a con man, con man named David C. Stevenson, grew so influential in electing local and state officials, the cluxing of America, as he called it. Stevens had aspirations to try to run for president as well. And he boasts, I am the law in Indiana. And he grew wealthy by skimming from the dues that he collected from all clan members, as well as selling robes and hoods. And again, he plans to run for the presidency of the United States. But the clan's influence, both in Indiana and nationwide, crumbled after Stevens was sentenced to life in prison in 1925 for kidnapping and raping a 28-year-old woman who then committed suicide. And at the same time, several states passed anti-Klan laws and others banned the wearing of masks. And by 1930, membership had dwindled to about 100,000 people, mostly Southerners. But the deep-seated, that bigoted impulse underlying the Klan lived on. And it's fed it by deep-seated fears and hatreds that have yet to disappear completely. And another big thing this is cut off at the top. It says this is a picture of the Scopes trial. And this is the other big reactionary conservative movement of the 20s. Fundamentalism. While the Klan saw the threat mainly in the alien menace, many defenders of old-time religion, and this will be key with prohibition as well, old-time religion will view drinking as a sin. And that means it's got to be eliminated. And fundamentalists are threatened by ideas circulating in progressive 
or liberal Protestant churches, especially the idea that the Bible should be studied in light of modern scholarship, the higher criticism, or that it should accommodate Darwinian theories of biological evolution. In response to such modern notions, conservative Protestants embraced a militant new fundamentalism, which was distinguished less by a shared faith than by a posture of hostility toward liberal beliefs or beliefs in modern science and its insistence on the literal truth of the Bible. The fundamentalists will insist on this. And here's the Scopes trial defined. You can read that at another time if you like. Among national leaders, only the great commoner William Jennings Bryan, the former congressman, secretary of state under Wilson, and the three-time presidential candidate had the support, prestige, and eloquence to transform fundamentalism into a popular crusade. He passionately denounces Charles Darwin's theories. And the dramatic climax comes in 1925 in the tiny mining town of Dayton where civic leaders, eager for publicity and to get some tourists into town, they persuade John T. Scopes, who was a high school science teacher and a part-time football coach, to become the test case against this new law against teaching evolution. And he used a textbook that taught Darwinian evolution, and he got arrested. And the town boosters succeeded by, behind, beyond their wildest hopes. The Scopes trial received worldwide publicity, but not all flattering to Dayton, because this was a circus. It was a carnival. Evangelists, atheists, hot dog and soda pop peddlers, and hundreds of newspaper and radio reporters were there to report on this 12-day trial. A man tattooed with biblical verses preached on a street corner while a live monkey was paraded about town. And the stars of the show will be Brian, who's a true believer, and Clarence Darrow, the most famous lawyer of the time and a, defend, a tireless defender of the working class. He offers to defend Scopes and Evolution, along with the other attorney that Scopes had. Brian insisted the trial was not about scopes, but about a state's right to determine what was taught in public schools. And he announced that the contest between evolution and Christianity is a duel to the death. It's ironic that he said that. Darrell countered, scopes is not on trial. Civilization is on trial. The Enlightenment. His goal was to prevent bigots and ignoramuses from controlling the education of the United States by proving that America was founded on liberty and not on narrow, mean, intolerable, and brainless prejudice of soulless religio maniacs. And this is a famous 1960 Hollywood movie, Inherit the Wind. Spencer Tracy will portray Darrow. That's Harry Morgan, the Tennessee judge. He later played on MASH and TV. And this is Frederick Marsh, who plays William Jennings Bryan. And Gene Kelly is also a good character in this movie. He plays a character based on the acerbic newspaper reporter H.L. Mencken, who reported for the Baltimore Sun. And Darrell and Mencken will have many conversations throughout the course of this movie. That's well worth a look if you get a chance. At one point, he, Brian, he claimed, Brian claims that Darrell was insulting Christians. Darrell, his thumbs clasping his colorful suspenders, shot back, You insult every man of science and learning in the world because he does not believe in your fool religion. And these guys are really drained from the heat in Tennessee. And they lunged at each other and it prompted the judge to adjourn the court. And as the trial ended, the judge ruled, that the only issue before the jury was whether John T. Scopes had taught evolution, and no one had ever denied that he had. And they're eager to get on with their lives and to get their harvest in. And the jurors did not even sit down before deciding that Scopes was guilty. But the court, while upholding the anti-evolution law, waived his fine on a technicality. So both sides claimed victory. And five days after the trial ended, the great commoner died of a heart attack. This trial killed him, and Scopes ended up leading Dayton, leaving Dayton to study geology 
at the University of Chicago and he becomes a petroleum engineer. I'm sure he made a lot of money. And meanwhile, the Scopes trial only sharpened the national debate between fundamentalism, which is still around today, and the debate on the teaching of evolution in schools. That leads into prohibition, which we will pick up in the second half of the reactionary conservatism of the 1920s.